Titus chapter 2. The title of the message, A Christian Life is a Separated Life. We are Bible believers, and the Bible teaching indicates that the Christian life should be a separated life. Two ways, separated from the world, and number two, separated under the Lord. And I want you to see that tonight in this passage of Scripture, Titus 2. It's not unfamiliar at all. I, I come here to preach uh, at least in reference to these verses fairly often. We're going to begin reading at verse 11 through the end of the chapter, Titus 2, 11 through 15. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The Christian life is a separated life. Our Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts tonight and help us by the Holy Spirit to give the message in the way you would have us to do it and help us to listen with open ears and open hearts to receive your word, and may this message be helpful to all of us as we chart our course for life day by day. We thank you for your work. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an awful lot to say about the separated Christian life. It's a subject that's found repeatedly in the Bible. When I began to think about the topic of the separated Christian life, and I thought about various passages of Scripture that deal with that, a number of them came to mind. One word that comes to my mind in thinking about the separated Christian life is the word sanctify. And sanctify means to set apart. And when we were saved, we were sanctified by the Lord, set apart from the world. When you come to passages like uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and going across the division into chapter 7, he directly speaks to us about being separated and says, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And it gives some promises along with that. I'm somewhat afraid that in these days there's been such a, a departure of preaching on separated living that we really have lost in some ways our concept of biblical separation as it's given to us in the Bible. And it sometimes seems when you have a Bible message directed on this subject that it seems like you're a little odd to, to deal with that. Mrs. Daniel, bless her heart, used to say that the devil hates fundamental Bible-believing churches because they preach salvation by grace through faith, but he hates them also when they preach the separation of a Christian from the world. And I think she may have been right about that. In this passage of Scripture, you see at the beginning of the book, Titus chapter 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness... Verse 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And so he is explaining to Titus, this is what you're to do. You're helping get some elders, some pastors lined up in the churches there on that island. And then he goes into some things about what they're to teach them. And in his instruction about what he's going to teach them, he comes to this section that we read tonight, chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And he makes some special and important emphases that we dare not neglect and dare not forget. And so let's jump in with this number one. <clears throat> Based on verse 11, we understand that the free grace of God brings salvation to us. Look at your Bible again, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. I've heard for most of my life the definition that grace means God's unmerited favor. God shows his favor to us in ways that we do not merit. We don't deserve it. But God, in his great love, looks upon us in our sin and has mercy on us 
If I can make a little fine distinction here, many of you know this, but mercy generally we think of as God withholding his judgment from us, and grace is where God gives us in place of that his mercy and his salvation, eternal life, and all of the gifts that go with that. And so in in this passage of Scripture, I've, I've given you number one, the free grace of God uh, brings salvation to us. Notice again the words, the grace of God that bring a salvation hath appeared to all men. There's several important truths there. Number one is that we are saved by grace. Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. We're not saved. I know we repeat this again and again, but we're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by, by keeping commandments. We're not saved by observing sacraments. We're not saved by keeping ordinances of the church. And we're saved by the grace of God, God's grace. That's initiated on God's side. God brings his grace to us so that we might be saved and believe. I think another important statement in this verse, verse number 11, is this. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And that is that the grace of God that saves us is available to all. We have a great responsibility to see to it that people around the world hear that message. But as far as God is concerned, anyone who will hear and believe can be saved. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. There are some, I'm sad to say, but there are some who say God did not die for everybody and God did not make it possible for everybody to be saved. But this is one of the verses that say that the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. And you read in, in 2 John, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2, that Jesus Christ is a propitiation for our sins. That means he satisfies all of the holy demands of God is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That does not mean the whole world will be saved. It simply means that God has made provision for the salvation of all. Paul explains it again in Romans chapter 3, when he speaks of the grace of God and of the salvation that comes out of that, which is unto all and upon all them that believe. It's available to everybody, but it's effective in the lives of those who believe. And so we've said here under number one, that we're not saved by our works, but by the grace of God. We said, secondly, that that grace of God is available to all men. And number three, God brings that grace to us. Romans 1, 16, not ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Through the gospel, God brings the matter of salvation to us. In Romans chapter 10, you may remember, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, or oh, what's the word? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not, have not heard? And then he says, blessed are the feet of them that preach the gospel. That doesn't just mean pastors. That means every Christian that gives the gospel to somebody because we take the gospel to somebody. They hear it and ideally believe it. And they are saved by the wonderful grace of God. We're saved by him. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now watch this. If you can picture that verse in your mind in your Bible, John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, comma, even to them that believe in his name. What does it mean to receive him? That is believing on his name. I don't receive Christ when I take the bread and the cup. I don't receive him in that. I receive him, John 1, 12, the last part of the verse, when I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I hope that you know him and that you put your trust in him. And so this is number one. The free grace of God that brings salvation to us uh, is, is a wonderful gift from God. Number two, this will be a lot longer point than that one. The same grace that brings us salvation teaches us that when we are saved, we are to live a separated life from the world. This same grace teaches us that when we are saved, our lives in this present world are different is another way to say that. So grace does not just bring salvation. The grace also brings teaching to us. I'm glad that grace teaches us, aren't you? I'm glad that God didn't just say, okay, I save you by grace. There you are. You're on your own now. You know, that same grace bestowed on us by the Spirit of God, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, begins now, it may have begun before we were saved, as God is working and convicting us, 
but it begins now and continues all the way until we go to be with the Lord in heaven. It begins and continues teaching us certain things. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That, my friend, is a verse that teaches Christian separation from the world. We're no longer part of the world. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. And because of that, because of God's grace that he's given to us, our lives are moving in a new and a different direction. On the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. I hope that you know him and that you put your trust in him. And so this is number one. The free grace of God that brings salvation to us uh, is, is a wonderful gift from God. Number two, this will be a lot longer point than that one. The same grace that brings us salvation teaches us that when we are saved, we are to live a separated life from the world. This same grace teaches us that when we are saved, our lives in this present world are different, is another way to say that. So grace does not just bring salvation, but grace also brings teaching to us. I'm glad that grace teaches us, aren't you? I'm glad that God didn't just say, okay, I save you by grace, there you are, you're on your own now. But no, that same grace bestowed on us by the Spirit of God, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, begins now, it may have begun before we were saved, as God is working and convicting us, but it begins now and continues all the way until we go to be with the Lord in heaven. It begins and continues teaching us certain things. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that... Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That, my friend, is a verse that teaches Christian separation from the world. We're no longer part of the world, we're saved. We're on our way to heaven. And because of that, because of God's grace that he's given to us, our lives are moving in a new and a different direction. Notice, first of all, in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness. When he says we're denying ungodliness, he doesn't mean we deny that it exists, but we turn away from it. We don't want to walk in ungodliness. The world is filled with ungodliness, and that's not brand new. If you would go, we're not going to turn to it now, but if you'd go to the book of Jude, that one little chapter book at the end before Revelation, he talks about how Enoch the uh, the man that walked with God and God took him home, he talked about how he preached in about five or six times in that little section, two or three verses, he used the word ungodly. And in his days, which were before the flood of Noah, the world was full of ungodliness. And now in our days, 2,000 years after the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our world is also filled with ungodliness and he says to us that we are to deny ungodliness that is a turn away from that which does not build godly character in our lives or ungodliness just leaves God out of the picture that's why we spend a lot of time and money in trying to provide a Christian education for people because we don't want our education to be ungodly leaving God out that's why we offer activities for our young people, and Brother and Sister Lancaster do a lot of activities. Some are fun, some are serious, and uh, the ones that the ones that Phil leads are fun. The ones that Randy leads are are serious and and tries to get the kids straightened up after the other ones. I'm kidding, of course, but uh, we want them to have some activities in an environment, in an atmosphere that is not ungodly and going to harm them in their Christian lives. I want to say that when you live an ungodly life. You are bringing harm to yourself. In him we live and move and have our being. That's what the scripture says. But when we leave him out of the picture, we leave an, live an ungodly life. We don't bring him in. We miss out on the resources of assurance and salvation and of the peace of God in our hearts and of courage and strength to stand. And so as a Christian, get this, you and I are instructed here to deny ungodliness. Here comes an influence for our lives, and it's ungodly, and it would turn our hearts away. We say, no, I, I'm going to abstain from that. Denying and abstaining would be a good pair of synonyms in that. So in this, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Ungodliness has to do with our relationship with ourselves. I want to know the Lord in my life. I want the Lord to be present there. The next things have to do with our relationships with others. Notice, if you will, not only are we to deny ungodliness, but to deny worldly lusts. And then he gives several things on the positive side about how we're to live. The world is not a friend of grace. 
Uh, we, I don't know, we sing it sometimes, but there's songs in the hymnal that talk about, uh, shall I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others fought to gain the prize, supported on their knees or moving forward on their knees. I'm getting the words mixed up here on that song. But the reality is that, that when we are living in the world, the world has announced itself as an enemy of God. I think more so in some ways, maybe because of television and internet and other ways, so much more blatantly and in your face than at other times. We, we don't want what the Bible says. We don't care what the Bible says about life and the sacredness of it. We don't care what the Bible says about marriage. And we don't care what the Bible says about liberty and freedom in Christ. And, and we want to go our own direction and live our own way. That's the world's lust. And you and I are to deny the worldly lusts that come to us in this world. There are things in the world that are, are uh, craving for pleasures. There are things that, that may be immoral, that are part of the world. The world is constantly bombarding us with indecency and immorality. And we want to say, no, that's not the course of my life. I'm... I'm saddened today i read about a pastor that that got involved in a situation with the law and, and uh, ended up taking his own life and part of the problem is that the worldly loss affected his heart and, and he went in a wrong direction and we've got to be aware all of the time that we want to follow godliness and walk, not walk in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the world that deals with our neighbor. How do I relate to my neighbor? How do I, how do I respond to his enticements? This also deals with our living among our neighbors. In verse 12 again, not only do we deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but we should live soberly. We should live soberly. I think there are two things about that. Uh, this, I try to be careful here, but this is a, uh, this is a, temptation for me, an area where I've got to watch myself. Because I think when he says we're to live soberly, we're not to live always in a silly, frivolous manner. And if you know me, I sometimes get too silly and frivolous in my conversation. I think I try to balance it with some sobriety and living that way. But there's a certain seriousness about life and a sobriety about life. And I'm talking about our mental state uh, that, that we have sober thinking and we recognize the differences between godliness and ungodliness. And we recognize the significance of the word of God and of its authority in our lives. So there's sober living. I think the other side of that, I don't think I'm stretching it even in the slightest to say that when he speaks about living soberly, we're to avoid things that would affect our way of thinking. In my notes, I, worked, I wrote the word substances. And I'm thinking about alcohol. I think Christians should be total abstainers from alcohol. You read in Proverbs 20, how many times do I say it? Verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And the, the scriptures give numerous reasons why a Christian should abstain from that. If nothing else, it, it harms our thinking. And you say, how much you have to have? I don't know how much you have to have, but I know that it makes an impact in our, in our way of living. And the fact of the matter is that we would be wise to avoid that which causes repeatedly our brothers and sisters and our neighbors to stumble. Why well, don't want to be in, engaged in something that's causing uh, thousands of people every year to be involved in automobile accidents and involved in the breakup of homes and involved in the abuse of children and of wives? And sometimes, if I may say, sometimes abuse of husbands, because that's a two-way street, you know. Live soberly. Avoid those things. I believe that our, our states around the country, and I'm afraid that we have some movement in this direction now on the federal level, on both sides maybe of the, of the, of the uh, political parties, to uh, take away the restrictions on the use of marijuana. And I think it's done great damage in our culture. It's done damage in our cities. It's done damage among our young people. It's done damage if you're thinking about recruiting people for a military service. I'm not talking about drafting. I'm talking about recruiting them. You'll find many of our leaders that say that there's a shortage of sound-minded young people to be engaged in our armed forces. And I'm not here to promote the armed forces necessarily, but I am here to say we must live soberly and avoid those things that would cloud our judgment and cloud our thinking. 
live soberly. And then the next one, same verse here, verse number 12, we should live soberly and righteously. Every day you and I are confronted with certain choices. And the choices that we make are going to either be right or wrong. Would you agree with that? We're facing choices. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? How am I going to live? What am I going to watch? What am I going to read? What am I going to listen to? What am I going to say? What am I going to do? And we're confronted day by day with choices. And I, I suggest you tonight that living righteously means that we make righteous choices in our daily living. Well, what does a righteous choice mean? I'm going to tell you that I believe that a righteous choice is one that is in harmony with what the Bible says. And I want to say secondarily to that, that there's no way I can make choices that are consistent with what the Bible says if I do not know what the Bible says. And I cannot know what the Bible says unless I read it. And if I can't read, then I listen to it. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to know what the Bible means. I want to know how the Bible applies to my life. And then I want to apply it to my life. James 1, 22, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Remember the illustration that he says that a man that's a hear the word and not a doer is like a man that beholdeth his face in a glass and then walketh away and forgetteth what manner of man he was. I illustrated that in our Christian school years ago and several times since in Christian school chapels. And I said, here I am in the morning, I get up and I go in the bathroom and I lather up to shave and, and uh, I'm, I'm shaving, I got this much finished and the phone rings and I set my razor down and I walk over to pick up the telephone and it's somebody that's got a question or somebody's got a request or somebody's got some need and I try to help with that and then I forget about what I am doing and I walk away and I come over to the school in the morning and the kids look at me funny and start laughing and I say, what's the matter? Why are you laughing? And they say, you have shaving cream all over that side of your face. Well, I looked in the book, I'm so I looked in the mirror, but I got distracted and I forgot what it was. And when I look at the Bible and I read the Bible and I see what it says and I turn away without doing anything about it, it's like I've forgotten what was in the book and I'm not doing it. And so he says, live righteously. We're to make right choices based on what the Bible says. When I read the Bible, there are commands. Some of those commands are positive. This you shall do. Some of those commands are negative. This you shall not do. In the Bible, there are examples for us to follow. Some of those are examples that we would say, I want to live like that man. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, follow me, be followers of me as I follow Christ. That's good counsel. As long as he followed Christ, we're going to follow him. On the other hand, there are examples, like I'm thinking of Samson, who was a man that had great opportunity, but he chose to go the wrong way on, on much of that. I'd say he's an example to not follow. But we have commandments, positive and negative. We have examples, good and bad. We have principles laid out for us in the Bible. And the reality is that many of the principles that are laid out for us in the Bible may not have the same force of a commandment directly, but the principle is there. There are a number of statements in the Bible where it says, these things are well-pleasing to the Lord. And it wasn't in a commandment, it was just simply a statement of fact and of doctrine. These things are well-pleasing to the Lord. That I, I think that God gives us some liberty to make choices about those things based on his word. And the principle is there. And may I say this, I think that there are many times when we come to a conclusion about something in the Bible and we develop a conviction and it becomes a standard for our living that we understand it seems the Holy Spirit has given me that. And I want to follow that with all of my heart, but I want to be gracious to my brothers and sisters in Christ who maybe have not come to that same conclusion. I want to be sure that I'm following the Word of God and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But I have to realize there's some things that God directs for me, maybe because of my experiences, maybe because of my parenting, maybe because of my parenting my children. There are certain things that, that may not have been absolutely wrong and sinful, but I, because of their position as preachers' kids, or kids, their position as Christian young people, their positions as students in a Christian school, their position in many ways, there are things that we may have asked of them to abstain and stay away from them where others were engaging in them. And it wasn't because things were sinful, but it was because we wanted to make a righteous choice that we believe for our family and for our home was the right choice. 
I think I mentioned this a week or two ago. My dad said, you can't do that. And I said, why not, Dad? Everybody's doing it. He said, not everybody. You're not. The Watts aren't doing that. And so you understand, everything I believe in, everything I practice in my life doesn't necessarily mean you have to do that. But there are things that as you're studying, making wise decisions based on the principle of the word of God, that you say, Lord, lead me, God, direct me, Lord, help me to establish the right standard for my life and for my family as I do so. We're talking about living righteously, making decisions about life based on what the Bible says. Again, same verse, he says, not only living soberly and righteously, but living godly. And when he says we're living godly, I want to put this definition by that, living with honor and reverence for God. The Bible says, again, same verse, he says, not only living soberly and righteously, but living godly. And when he says we're living godly, I want to put this definition by that, living with honor and reverence for God. He's not my next door neighbor. He's not... John Doe down the street. He is God. And when I live godly, I mean I want to have a proper reverence, a proper respect. I don't use this word very often, but I think I want to have a proper awe of God. I'm afraid that sometimes we become familiar with the Bible and we see some amazing, miraculous things that God has done. And we've read it so many times and we've heard it so many times, we just let it pass by. But the things in creation and judgment and in God's working in miracles and many that he does in our lives become sort of ho-hum and commonplace for us. But I'm going to live godly. I want to magnify his name. It's in the Psalms where he says, come, let us magnify, let us exalt his name together so we want to live godly desiring and devoted to knowing him and to making him known it's a good thing to know the lord but it's even a greater thing to make him known i hadn't thought about this not in my notes but i had a, a message that i preached again probably young people in the school and i probably preached it here when we were young in our ace school back in rochester we would go to the ACE conventions, and one of their speakers was a man by the name of Dr. Ralph, I don't even know if he's a doctor, but Ralph Rice, and he was an interesting speaker, and uh, he said uh, he had been to a military base, maybe one of his children was in the service, and they recited this poem, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. How many know that poem? You've heard it before? All right. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. And I went in my reading of the Bible one time to John chapter 1, and um, uh, in that chapter, uh, Peter and Andrew, Andrew first, then Peter, and then James and John, they were saved, and then they went to the Lord's place and abode with him that day, and then they went out with their missionary journey telling everybody about Christ, and I said, good, better, best, that's what that's talking about, it's good to be saved. Would you agree with that? It's good to be saved. And it's even better to abide in Christ, to walk with him, to listen to his word and to pray and have fellowship with his people. It's good to be saved. It's even better to abide in Christ. And it's best of all to bring others to Christ. And that's what the disciples did. And so we say we're to live godly, devoted to knowing him and making him known. Now, let me ask you a controversial question. You like those, don't you? Was the apostle Paul some sort of a legalist when he called on Christians to live right in relationship to themselves denying ungodliness worldly lust was Paul a legalist when he said to the people I want you to live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world was he a legalist I contend to you tonight that he was not at all he's simply giving to us the motivation and the direction and the power and the duration of God's call to separated living I started this direction a little bit ago and I said our avowed enemies it doesn't mean we made them our enemies but they've made themselves enemies of us who are saved are the world the flesh and the devil and they are hostile to the things of God. And we want to be careful not to yield a foot of our territory to the world and the flesh and the devil. And the reality is that while we're not yielding to them, we want on the other side to reclaim that which they've already taken from us. In our personal lives, in our church life. 
We, we want personally be separated on the Lord, but as a church body, we want to be a separated body, living holy lives under the Lord. And people might look at El Vista Baptist Church and say, well, there's a rich church. You don't believe that? Just look around, all the rich people here tonight. They might say, oh, Vista Baptist Church is a, is a loud church. And it's loud. Just listen to Lancaster leading the singing. It's a loud church. Wild. No, they wouldn't say that about us. But I wouldn't be at all upset if somebody said, oh, Vista Baptist Church is a Bible-believing and Bible-preaching and Bible-practicing church. It's separated from the world, but also concerned about the souls of men and women and of boys and girls. And so Paul is telling us as a as an individual and telling us as a church congregation that we are to be a separated group of people saved by grace. Thank God for free grace. But then when we've been saved by that grace, that grace teaches us how we're to live. But I say in the third major part here, number one was the free grace of God brings salvation. Number two, grace teaches us to live a separated life. Number three is this, that we are to have our eye on the sky as we walk in life every day. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you a couple of things real quickly about that. When he says looking for it, I think Paul is saying it's imminent. It's imminent. It could occur at any moment. Keep your eyes open for the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take us home to be with him in heaven. And then the next thing, this is not really too much in, in the message tonight, but I think it's a good valid Bible teaching point, and that is it describes the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't pretend to be a Greek scholar. I did have some Greek in school. And, I'm, and I told you this morning, I'm going to Greece, and so that'll serve me well, I'm sure. I don't think it will at all. But the fact is that in the Greek language, that phrase, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, some of you know this and may remember it before, that is an example of the Granville Sharp rule, the G Sharp rule. That's how I was taught it in Greek class years ago. The idea is that when you have two nouns, God and Jesus Christ, joined together, and the first noun has the definite article, the, the great God, and the second article does not have that, the second now does not have that Savior Jesus Christ that both of them are referring to the same thing in other words when he says that the, the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ those are both referring to the same person that makes sense what I'm saying that's a description of the deity the Godhood of Jesus Christ and that's not the point of the message tonight but it is a valid point I like to point things out like that to you from time to time and here's here's what I want you to see this is the point that as we're walking along he says we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ I quoted this the other day I've heard him, heard him say it many times Dr. Robertson at Tennessee Temple that is his belief in the coming of Jesus Christ that kept him a fundamentalist he said, I was always watching. I was aware that Jesus Christ could come at any minute. I didn't want to get off from fundamental doctrine, Bible doctrine, into some heresy. I didn't want to get, get off into some worldly living. Because at any moment, Jesus Christ may come and take us home to be with him in heaven. So we're to live, I use the phrase, looking to the sky with our eye on the sky. The coming again of the Lord Jesus is our blessed hope. If you live the kind of life, verse 12 teaches us, denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, living soberly, righteous, and godly in this world. If you live that kind of a life, you may find yourself sometimes standing alone. I mentioned this morning in the message on marriage that one of the great needs in the human race is the problem of loneliness. And even in spiritual fellowship, when we're trying to do right and we feel that we're alone, Elijah did. Lord, I'm the only one left. And the Lord said, no, I have 7,000 that have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. But here we are alone. What's my hope in the midst of that? It's the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's talking about, keeping our eyes on the sky. It's great. When you're in a, in a sports contest and there's somebody special to you that's watching the game and you get up to bat and you look over into the, into the grandstand or into the bleachers and there's your wife or if you're young and unmarried, there's your girlfriend 
and she's looking at you and you look over at her and she winks at you and gives you the thumbs up and says, you can do it, old man. You can do it, young man. You can hit that ball. It's encouraging. You just want to swing that bat and knock the ball right out of the park. Amen. I'm looking, I'm looking into the grandstand to find somebody, my spouse or my, my kids, if you will. Maybe I'm looking at the bench for the coach, somebody to look and say, you can do this. And when I read this verse, and he says, I'm looking to heaven. I'm looking for the blessed hope. I like the thought that I can look up to heaven and say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. And the Lord says, yes, I know you'll do it. Stay at it. Keep on going. And he does. Hebrews 11. Uh, we're encompassed. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11. We're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses who have made the journey. And they're saying, at least by their testimony recorded in that great faith chapter, keep on going. You can do it. You can make it. God is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so we are to have one eye on the sky as we walk, not only because of the encouragement that he gives to us, but also the fact that we know he's going to take us home and he's going to acknowledge and reward us for that labor which we've done for him. Number four, I want you to notice in verse 14, again, this comes back to a similar thing to verse 11, and that is the matter of salvation. The way I wrote it down is this, Christ made the total sacrifice of himself for us who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. When he gave himself for us, that was a total sacrifice. He held nothing back. When he was hanging on the cross near the end of his time there, he cried out, it is finished because he had done all that was necessary for our salvation. He'd lived a sinless life. Now he's bearing our sins in his body and he's about to die. And when he died there, he made the total sacrifice of himself for us. I'm grateful for that. But he did so for two reasons. Number one, to redeem us from all iniquity. What was it that was destroying us? It was iniquity. It was sin. What was that that was binding us? We were in slavery and bondage to it. That was sin. That was our iniquity. And we're in all of that, and the Lord Jesus Christ died to redeem us from that. Number two, when he died on the cross, he didn't only redeem us, but he also purifies unto himself a peculiar people. I've heard a lot of preachers say this in churches like ours. Our church is full of peculiar people. We have a lot of peculiar people in this place. That's not the kind of peculiar he's talking about. The word peculiar there is a word that means a people of his own. We belong to him. You understand we're not our own. We're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits. He's redeemed us for a peculiar people to himself. I read this today. He is stripping away the filthy garments of the past and adorning us in his own garment, the pure white linen, if you will, of his own righteousness. I didn't write the man's name down that said this. It was Dr. T, and I can't remember his last name. I can find it for you again if you're, if you're troubled about the name of this man that gave this fairly lengthy quotation. He has purified unto himself a peculiar people. Here's what he said. The gospel has purified the polluted. It hath made the dishonest honest, the intemperate sober, the licentious chaste. It has converted the monster of depravity into the humble, correct, consistent, temperate disciple of Christ. The abandoned woman it has purified and refined. And he who was at once the disgrace, the honor of his family, of society, and of his country, he has renewed, reformed, sanctified, and made holy. It has, uh, it, it, he has been placed at the feet of his Redeemer, and he there recovered uh, his um, something, and he was clothed and in his right mind. That's referring to the demoniac of Gadara, Mark chapter 5. And he's saying this, when the Lord saved us and he made us a peculiar people, he made us his very own people so that we might know him and live for him as that. That's what I want. And that's what I believe God wants for his children the fact of the matter is that he wants us to be a peculiar people unto him, living as though we are his own. Look at verse 14. Zealous 
of good works. Not just that we've been uh, redeemed, not just that he's purified us. We don't stop there. We are also to be zealous of good works. We're ready to go. We're ready to be on fire for God, zealous. We're ready to do any kind of work that God has for us to do that would result in his glory and his honor. Finally, let me take you to verse 15. And here he says to Titus, Paul is writing this younger preacher. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And again, here are three things in this one verse. Titus, you've heard what I said. He starts up in the beginning of chapter 2 talking about how he's supposed to address the aged men. And then in verse 3, the aged women. And they teach in verse 4, the young women. And in verse 6, the young men. And then when they come in as grace of God's appear to all men. And you're to be a peculiar people and live for the Lord and deny all of these things we've been talking about tonight. And now he recognizes that when Titus goes to the churches of Crete, and we won't take time to read it now, but if you go back to chapter 1, you'll find that there are some things going on on the island of Crete where people are not really eager to hear everything that the Lord said through his preachers. But he says in verse number 15, these things speak. How shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how should they believe if they haven't heard of him? And so how do we encourage people to live right? We must speak it. Somewhere along the line, somebody has to say, this is what the Bible says, and this is how we should live. Not only that, but secondly, these things speak and exhort. To exhort means to preach it, to give some enthusiasm behind it, to give some fervor to it, to say, I, I think God wants you to do this, and don't sit back and ignore it, but do what God says. That's exhortation. Maybe you remember hearing me say this, that I believe in expository preaching. I think we've done so that tonight we've gone verse by verse in the passage and tried to explain what it says. And I, I believe in that. And I, I think that's sound Bible preaching. But I think there have been men in my lifetime who were exhorting preachers. And they would maybe take a text of scripture. Charles Spurgeon used to take a text of scripture and go a thousand times, it seemed, around that and, and expound it in very many ways. Whether in preachers, Curtis Hudson was one. I, I normally didn't think of him as a, as an expository preacher in his church. I, I know he did some because I heard some of his messages there, but he was an exhorter. And when he would preach on, on soul winning, You'd have something burning in your heart that would cause you to want to go outside and find the next person and witness to them. And there are people that would preach on separated living. You want to go home and throw out all the worldly things in your wardrobe and buy things that are decent and, and modest and honoring to the Lord. They were exhorters and they challenged us and charged us. And I've said over the years, I miss that. I don't know very many preachers are doing that today. I don't feel like that's my gift. I don't feel like, I feel like when I try to exhort and do that, everybody says, Okay, Pastor, that's a nice little sermon you got there. But there are some, and we're supposed to do it. We're to speak it, and then we're to exhort it and say, let's go. And then the third thing in the verse is we're to rebuke. And notice how he says that. We're to rebuke with all authority. Not every opinion do I have gives me authority to rebuke anybody. But I come to what the Bible says and the principles of the word of God and people are refusing to follow them, I have a responsibility to issue some rebukes. I was in a church in Galesburg, good friend of mine, he's not there now, he's in Florida, but he, I never was around a pastor just like he was, and he would be in the middle of a sermon, he'd call out somebody, Larry Young, I just pick on you since you're in my line of sight, he'd just go out and say, Larry Young, you gotta quit that, what you've been doing, I've heard about what you're doing, that, that's not me. That might be why he's in Florida today instead of in Illinois. I don't know. But there is some measure when you're talking about the Bible. There is some measure for correction. I don't want to embarrass people. I don't want to put people on the spot. But it may be in a general way. You address the subject and you rebuke people who don't want to hear what the Word of God says. And he says, rebuke with all authority. People resist that sometimes. We don't want the preacher to have any authority. And I think some preachers wield authority like they're a dictator or something like that. But we do have some authority. And we're to rebuke with all authority. And then he says this. This will be the end of it. Let no man despise thee. Not everybody's going to like it, Titus. Everybody's going to like it in 2024. But you've got to preach what the Bible says. You've got to speak it. You've got to exhort it. You've got to rebuke it sometimes. And not everybody will like it. But don't let them despise you. Don't let them make you feel like you're not doing what God wants you to do. We're commanded to declare the word of God. Let me just go back very quickly here and say, 
that God's free grace has brought us salvation. But that very same free grace has taught us that we are to live a separated under the Lord and a separated from the world life on a daily basis. And I hope that you'll take that to heart and allow the Lord to help you and me to live lives that are bent in the direction not of worldliness, but in the direction of holiness and godliness. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the Bible and thank you for its challenge to us to live separated Christian lives. There are so many areas of life where you teach us principles and how we're to be different from the world. Maybe in future messages we'll look at some of those, but I pray that you'll teach us and instruct us and give us a desire to be your kind of people, separated to you, separated from the world.